eyes to see with. When you see things, you're using your sense of sight. Ears to listen with. When you listen to sounds, you're using your sense of hearing. Fingers to feel with. When you feel something, you're using your sense of touch. Now, all scientists, and that I hope includes all of you, use their senses to get information. But how reliable are our senses? And how can we be sure that the information they give us is right? Now, what do you make of this? Is it a vase? Is it a candlestick? Or is it a... Well, what do you see? Could it possibly be two faces looking at each other? And what do your eyes make of this? Is it unwinding? It's just a spiral printed on a card. When it spins one way, it seems to unwind. When it spins the other way, it seems to wind up. Now, what can you see here? Just black and white marks? Or is there an animal lurking in there? Finally, what is this? It looks like a flat diagram, but... It's a wire cube. So you see, your eyes can be fooled. That's why it's important, if you're a scientist, always to check your observations to make sure you've got them right. Now here's another example. Which line looks longer? Let's change the direction of the arrows. Let's change the direction of the arrows again. In fact, both lines are exactly the same length, but the direction of the arrows seems to make a difference. Even when you can see on the ruler that the two lines are exactly the same length, your eyes are fooled by the direction of the arrows. Now, sometimes two people looking at the same thing may see it differently, and both may be right. Let me show you what I mean. What can you see here? Most people see a pretty young girl, but some people see... <laughs> Did you see the old lady? <laughs> or did you see the young girl? So, two people looking at the same picture can see it entirely differently. <laughs> Yet, both are right. Sometimes in your work in science, you'll get a result that's different from that of one of your friends. And that doesn't mean that one of you is right and the other's wrong. All it does mean is that there is a difference. And if you're being really scientific, you'll try and find out why there's a difference. Well, now we're going to look at the way some ideas in science and technology are tested and developed. Now, I'm sure you all know what a pocket calculator is, and you've probably seen one. But I'll bet you've never seen one like this. It's a talking calculator. Thank you very much indeed. That's quite enough of that. Now, the point about this machine is that it's very useful for people who have lost one of their senses, people who are blind. Angela, how useful is it to you? Well, I think most people would find it very difficult to do long division and multiplication sums in their heads. Mm -hmm. And as we can't jot it down on paper, one of these would be very useful. But in fact, there is one snag to this machine. It's very expensive, and so it wouldn't be possible to provide everyone with one. So to show us some of the more ordinary things that can help everybody, we've got with us today Jerry Newell of the Royal National Institute for the Blind. 
Jerry, could you show us some of the things that you've developed? Yes, certainly. And one of the very latest ideas for the blind are these braille clothing tags. And what we've done, we've woven dots of coloured cotton onto the tags. And the dots you can see here actually spell the name of the colour in braille so that a blind person can sew these into a shirt, dress or coat and by reading these braille dots immediately identify very easily the colour of the garment. Would you like to try it? Thank you. Well, I can actually see the colour, but I can't re read it because, as you said, they're in, it's in Braille. Angela, would you like to try and read it for us? Yes, this one is purple. Well, I can see it and you can feel it. How useful would tags like this be for you? These would be very useful. For instance, I have five jumpers, all exactly made of the same material and the same style, and until now I've had to run up and downstairs to my family asking them the different colours. Now I can sew these into them and next winter I'll have no problems. Well, we thought you might be interested to know how Braille works because, believe it or not, it's based on just six little dots. The six raised dots are arranged in three rows, each of two dots. The letter A uses the first dot in the top row, B the first dots in the first two rows, and C, two dots in the top row. D, E and F use other combinations of the dots in the top two rows, and so do G, H, I and J, and that's the first ten letters of the alphabet. The pattern for the second ten letters is very simple. Just add the first dot in the bottom row to the combinations for the first ten. The pattern for the next letters is again very simple. Just add the second dot in the bottom row. And that's how the Braille alphabet is made up. But as well as letters, there are combinations of dots for five common words. And there are other combinations which you can find out about for yourselves. Jerry, where do ideas like this come from? Do you actually think them up yourself? Well, we get ideas from all sorts of people, and particularly, actually, from blind people themselves. A very good example of this is this wooden model of a simple counting device, which was actually built by a blind man himself. I'd actually like to have a look. Now, the condition it's in at the moment, as you can see, it's not suitable for testing for the blind. So what we've done is redesigned it and produced this small, far more compact device, which is easier to demonstrate. And how does that work? Well, as the name suggests, it's a simple counting device. I'll show you. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And there are four of these. Units, tens, hundreds and thousands. Now, a very good example of its use, in fact, is for shopping. If somebody wants to add the total of, say, an item worth 25 pence, one, two on the tens of pence, one, two, three, four, five on the pence. Now, so that they don't have to remember that, there is a record of it on the calculator, so they can use their sense of touch to read these raised buttons here, two and a five, so they have a permanent record. So, in fact, as, as well as using their sense of touch, they're using their sense of hearing, aren't they? Oh, very much so, yes. How do you test devices like this out? Do you shut your eyes and try them, or what? Well, we do initially when we, we first think of the idea, but obviously the best people to test the devices are the blind people themselves. When we give them a prototype device, they will soon tell us what is wrong with it, give us advice, tell us how to redesign it until we reach the perfect instrument so that we can market it for the general public. This calculator would be quite useful for things like shopping, as you said, but for more complicated things like long division and long multiplication, you'd probably need something more like the talking calculator, wouldn't you? Oh, yes, but the problem with that, of course, is that it's so expensive, far too expensive for many blind people. But to overcome this, there's the very latest prototype of a bleeping calculator. Four plus five equals... Nine. Is this available yet? No, again, this is a very early prototype and we have still a lot more testing and research work to go on this machine before it's readily available for the blind, I'm afraid. Well, thanks very much, Jerry. 
So you've seen how scientists take ideas and very carefully test and develop them. To find out how, what scientists are doing to help blind people to move about more freely, Fergus went along to the National Mobility Centre in Birmingham. Mobility means getting about. And to be able to get about easily, you need to know where you are and what's around you. Now, wherever you are, there are lots of clues for your nose and for your ears. And they're there all the time. But usually, we don't even bother about them. And then there are smells. But if you're blind, your other senses are not really enough. Now you can get a bit more information with one of these. Blind people started using white walking sticks about 50 years ago. But really, they were just a signal that they were blind. But they were also useful to feel and hear if you were walking along next to something like a wall. The only difficulty with them was that they didn't tell you whether the ground in front of you was safe to walk on. So you had to walk very slowly. Now the scientists decided they would do something about trying to improve the walking stick. And they developed this. Now what's so clever about a long white cane? Walter Thornton is blind. He uses the long cane to sweep the space in front of him. When he comes to a wall, he doesn't tap his way along it. He checks by touching it and then strides away. The extra length of this cane means that Walter gets advance warning of dangers like these steps. And he can walk down them just as confidently as anyone else. So lengthening the stick was a very simple improvement, but it makes all the difference. Blind people know where they are mainly through their sense of hearing and sense of touch. Various things tell me that I am actually at the corner. There is much more movement of air. The feeling of the high wall on my right is not so close. I can distinguish the metal manhole cover with my cane and with my feet. We all have to be careful crossing roads. I have to make sure that I'm set to go straight over by the shortest way by having my feet over the edge of the pavement, checking with my cane. Then, of course, I listen carefully to make absolutely sure there is nothing coming. So a blind person can confidently move about using his senses of hearing and touch and a very simple piece of technology. Now here's a more complicated piece of technology for the blind. It looks like a pair of glasses, but it's not. The important bit is here. This central spot has a tiny transmitter. It sends out a very high-pitched sound. When the sound hits an object, it bounces back, an echo. And these two little receivers hear that echo. Then the sound is carried to your ears through these little earpieces. Let's see now how Walter manages with these on. That kind of twanging noise has a special meaning for me. It means overlap fencing. If I turn and look at it straight on, the signal's different. You'll notice there's a clear kind of whistle. Turn and look at the fencing from this angle, and it's a different sound again, a kind of mushy sound. Listen again for that clear signal. The twanging noise, that twanging means overlap fencing with the overlap towards me. Let me check to see if I'm right. Yes. Now there's a lamp post. Notice how the pitch goes from high to low as I get nearer.
That, I think, is a car. It's parked by the side of the road. And there's a bush. And there's... This is a sound I rather like. It reminds me very much of church bells, and it does, in fact, mean a basket weave fence. So, with their other senses, the help of good ideas and modern technology, people with no sense of sight can get about almost as easily as the rest of us. This old machine, which you sometimes still see in fairgrounds, uses a very important idea. Now, inside is a roll containing a series of photographs, each one slightly different. Now, if you look at them one at a time, they're not particularly interesting. But if you flick quickly through the pictures, then as if by magic, you get movement. Your eye hasn't got time to separate the pictures. One runs into another and we see movement. It's this same idea that enables you to see me. Now, you're not actually looking at me. You're looking at a lot of still pictures of me, 25 of them every second. Now, in case you find that difficult to believe, we'll slow the pictures down and look at them one at a time. Ready? Begin to slow the pictures down now. Speed up again to 25 frames a second. And there you are. The reason why television works is because your eyes can be fooled, just like a flick book. Which is something you might like to try and make for yourselves. Now, there are lots of things you can do after the program to find out more about your own senses. But remember to be very careful, as things are not always what they seem to be. Say goodbye, Anne. What do you mean, goodbye? <sighs> what have you done to me? Goodbye.